So it's uh, my great pleasure, uh, both personally and on behalf of Darian and the other organizers, to uh, welcome and introduce you to Professor Kahlil Mavotny, who comes to us from Prague, uh, who comes to us from Prague, who is the director of the Institute for Central European Philosophy, Central, Central European, European, European Institute for Philosophy, yeah. um, and who is, as you know, the author of many works on Patochka and other aspects of uh, European philosophy. And I'd also like to just take a moment to acknowledge the generous support of the Czech Center um, that was instrumental in, in organizing and facilitating um, these past two days, and especially the presence of Professor Novotny. Professor Novotny will speak to us in English, uh, deliver his lecture in English, during the question and answer session, um, it might be the case, um, depending on how tired he is, <laughs> that he would respond in French to your question, but in that case, uh, I will translate whatever he says into English. So you can ask your question in English, but he might decide, depending on uh, how, how he wants to think about your question, to speak in French, in which case then it will be translated. So thank you for coming in and speaking to us. Thank you very much for the invitation. Maria and uh, for this introduction. I will uh, present you a paper uh, written uh, some time ago on uh, Europe and post-Europe. Uh, and uh, I say it's not written from the same background. Uh, the discussions uh, took place uh, from the background of political philosophy. I was uh, rather uh, it, it is uh, written in a context of uh, my uh, PhD dissertation, uh, which was uh, about the natural world, phenomenological concept, and the concept of uh, the philosophy of history uh, that was important for Patochka, <coughs> but not, not uh, from the background of the political philosophy, and I am a little bit skeptical about the possibility to construct a political philosophy on Patochka in disagreement with you, I know, but this is my position. So, <clears throat> the philosophy of history of Jan Patochka run uh, the risk of a Eurocentrism. Eurocentrism, yeah. Central passages in his last book, Heretical Essays on the Philosophy of History, reflect an explicit Eurocentrism in the very language Patochka employs uh, to express his views. The passages in question concern Patochka's adoption of Husserl and Heidegger regarding the historicity of the present. Despite important differences between the two, Husserl and Heidegger share the following fundamental axiom. History stands, rise and falls with the formative philosophical concept of Occidental Europe, namely spirit, Geist. Patochka argues in various places that seem to reflect this sentiment there is no other history than European history. This is a quotation from Platon and Europe. Such a conception of history and its corresponding philosophy of history appears prima facie quite naive and moreover dangerously Eurocentric. In what follows, I will challenge these two points, the naivete and the reputed dangerousness of Patochka's philosophy of history. I will challenge them via his reflections on post-Europe. According to Patochka, we are living in an era subsequent to the conclusion of European-influenced history. It is a period of history that no longer pivots around Europe. Indeed, it's important to note that Patochka's supposed Eurocentricity crystallized precisely when he recognized Europe's de facto end and thus implements accordingly a strategy to deal with this new undefined context. Therefore, we can speak of the following somewhat paradoxical juxtaposition. <clears throat> First, there is only European history, but 
at least since the 1960s, we are supposedly living in a post-European epoch of history. History continues its development, although it should have run its course given Europe's failure in its political battle for the, for the world, or at the very least its political primacy in the world. A question remains, what exactly is meant by history? What makes history to history? Matuchka's answer, which evolves consistently throughout his corpus, is based on the following hypothesis. History has always its spiritual foundations that we have to try to understand. It is this reflective dimension in which life gains self-clarity and self-awareness. If it is indeed Patochka's hypothesis that historicity, uh, that this is historicity which make history to history in the spiritual existence of man, rooted no less in his uh, uh, spiritual legacy, in the recovery through which he bestires himself from this decimation, the assumption, assumption of the general tendency to decline is a necessary presupposition of this hypothesis, then the question arises, what exactly does Europe offer spiritually in this new situation, this new situation which is ours since the 60s? Is such a so-called post-Europe even historically achievable, desirable? From which framework uh, should we analyze the continuities and discontinuities between the old and the new? And despite our thoughts to the contrary, Europe remains the central point around which our self-understanding pivots as inheritors of its legacy. Matuchka's text from the beginning of the 70s, for example, his post-European epochs of history, which he only partially published, but also imprinted in his last essays, provide opportunity to analyze this constellation where these two opposing theories were developed. <clears throat> and my essay comprises uh, uh, four short sections. First, I will show how the new has been understood in post-Europe. Second, um, in the sections two and three, I present in two steps the dual approach in which Patochka addresses Europe constru constructively, while at the same time distances himself from the old Europe, producing his historical deconstruction. And last, Patuchka's positive answer to the challenge of the post-European epoch is sketched in the terms of his later writings. So the first point, the concept of post-Europe. It's obvious that the post-Europe designates uh, the end of Europe. Indeed, Europe's end is taken as a historical fact. Near the conclusion of World War II, at the latest, Europe lost its position as the world power. Patochka proceeds from this point in Europe's historical downfall and provides a description of the new impending world that has arisen like a phoenix upon the ashes of Europe. Of course, Patochka is concerned not with a geographical Europe, rather with an historical phenomenon, Europe, or more specifically, post-Europe, of which it can be said that it arose and fell. What determines our situation as new is the globalizing shift towards a techno-rational civilization which uh, emerged from Europe and operates in accordance with clear universalist aspirations. Europe conceived such, a, uh, conceived such a civilization as a prerequisite for a universal humanity, 
but no longer possesses the political power to serve as its figurehead. figurehead. Dynamism is connected with Europe, which inclines towards world history, but through the catastrophes of both world wars, Europe decisively lost its place at, as the center of world history. So this is to resume the, the main idea of post-Europe. Patochka first confronts the new of this situation in his essay, Spiritual Foundations of Life in our time, quoted uh, today already. The post-European epoch comprises as pluralism of varying historical entities no longer dominated by Europe, although it draws partly on the European heritage from some purposes. The discovery of any pluralism of spiritual sources, Matochka writes, can have a much more sweeping and deeper meaning than we recognize today. Here the meaning of reflection on the particularity and narrowness of the European tradition becomes quite clear. There emerges then the following contradiction. Rationality <coughs> requires a quote, a unified God, uh, God's eye view, a uh, homogenization. However, this is contradicted by various sources currently alive in non-European cultures. We face the danger of a devastating conflict in which these different cultures occlude themselves and ideologize their position." End of quote. Patochka didn't avoid justifying this approach to wit such a general historical reflection must explicitly uh, erect a framework in which the European, the non-European and post-European can all relate to and differentiate from one another. Patochka was fully aware that he must endorse a hypothesis that runs the risk that his framework would be too narrow, too formal, and ipso facto too broad. As the fundamental defining framework, Patochka again proposes spirit, Geist, as the, I quote, all determining essence and form of reality. In order to establish more concretely his hypothesis, he goes beyond the description of the zeitgeist of a particular epoch to the more general claim that every uh, zeitgeist, <coughs> spirit of epoch, I quote, is grounded on a certain conception of spirit, its nature and its fundamental purpose. The conclusions reached by Patochka's analysis should, however, be conceived, reconceived in accordance with the following. It is with a hypothesis about the fundamental framework, since Patochka's description and analysis both proceed from a provisional to an increasingly defined idea about the spirit, its essence, and its fundamental purpose. He wants to justify his hypothesis as the general methodological framework in which he develops his thesis about the continuity and discontinuity in history, which, according to him, evolves from the European into the universal. Uh, the second point is about deeper foundation of rationality. Taking seriously the evidence of irreducible plurality, Patochka asks whether the de facto loss of Europe's central role does not also entail overcoming certain principles that have historically contributed to the particular form of Europe. Patochka's is known for a method of overcoming his attempt to counterpose Cartesian subjectivism as a source of techno-scientism 
an assubjective ontology of being in the world. This methodology comprises fusing both Husserl's program of a deeper foundation of rationality, as a quotation, with Heidegger's ontological difference. Patochka endorses a transcendental approach that inquires into the possibility conditions of a foundation upon which the solution to the problem of, the, of a post-European humanity could be constructed. This problem arises out of globalization. It is a task to be actively achieved, I quote, to create a ground for the denizens of post-European history, which could perhaps be achieved via disintegration of Europe. I quote again, the post-European epoch is marked by a great possibility one that could lead all of future humanity, not only of technical understanding, verstand, but also that of self-reflecting reason itself, Vernunft, <coughs> end of quote. The disposition to build on unity-forming rationality is connected with the transcendental approach of Husserl's deeper fundamental uh, rationality, something, Patuchka, uh, something that Patochka never renounced. And I quote uh, Patochka, to avoid the fission of post-European humanity, this inner and outer tension, there exists no other means than the deeper ground of rationality than ever achieved in the Europe of the European historical epoch, epoch, end of quote. And on the other hand, Patochka proposes a solution with his opposition of ideology and life with the idea. Leben in der Idee. I don't know if the translation is correct, life within the idea, with the idea. And this is, is his, uh, this is, pardon, his early version of the ontological difference in, in my reading from 1946. Now, in the 60s, or in the end of 60s, in the text I quote, he proposes another concept, a uh, concept of the open soul, often as well. The mindset of openness, which to the open, it is which can be characterized only through the difference to every determinacy in parallel to this idea uh, of his negative Platonism uh, we heard about <coughs> today already. He proposes openness as the secret, uh, Geheimnis, also another concept we uh, heard about today. Uh, as the secret which is lived differently in every spiritual tradition. The deepest uh, dimension of the care of the soul, another, new, uh, another known concept, about which Patochka's late reflection on the soul as a spiritual principle of Europe, is the express reference to that which, qua secret, mm, unsettles, shaken any fixed shape of the spirit. And uh, so you can find a remark in the manuscripts uh, where he says spirit is being shaken. Just as in the negative Platonism this proposal is conceived as a defense against metaphysics which discards everything that cannot be objectively grasped. Against this enforcement and homogenization of the world, Patochka recalls the experience of transcendence, which must, however, remain negative. It cannot be positively grasped, thus subordinating objective knowledge. I come to the third point, the inner danger of Eurocentrism and critical self-reflection of Europe. 
If the conception of open soul is understood as an active distancing from the aggressive reach of technology's pursuit of world mastery, it would be interpreted in this new context of the post-European era as a signal of self-criticism of Europeans toward the other or the others. However, in this active distance of the open, open soul, one glimpses the internal danger of Eurocentrism. This should be not underestimated. Patochka opposes his conception to the spirit of the previous epochs of Europe, which, as he says, enacted the entrance of a universal consciousness of humanity, a terrible and cynical denial of human nature. According to Patochka, the open soul of the Europeans should engender the new world's spiritual attitude. However, if the attitude of uh, the open soul is interpreted as the search for the transcendental ground of post-European humanity, there is an internal risk of Eurocentrism as the attitude of the spiritual supremacy of Europe would be perpetuated against which non-European societies subsequently construct a defense and thereby distinguish the new state of affairs. In other words, it's questionable whether we, Europeans, equipped with the attitude of an open soul, that is, through the transcendental concept of openness towards uh, the undetermined transcendent, in contact with other spiritual traditions, exhibit less spiritual supremacy in relation to the other than if we would still present ourselves with a very specific conception, it is negation of the transcendent. The danger of Eurocentrism in this context appears to lie in the fact that we recommend the task of openness to the mystery of things, secret, Geheimnis, which we ourselves ascribe to us, the rationalist, together with a reductive technical reason of the white world. However, the question is whether this reflects accurately what Patochka was doing with his proposal of the open soul. It's important to highlight various points here. Uh, where it is clear that Patochka was consciously aware of the internal threat of Eurocentrism. Given this awareness, uh, he therefore conceived and developed the original concept of the open soul. The notion of European reflection, he says, for example, in his manuscripts, I quote, is not intended to render non-European reflection superfluous. <clears throat> uh, end of quote. Uh, rather, the meaning of European self-determination consists in, I quote, first actually introducing the non-European reflection and permitting it to bear fruit. Patochka's proposal to create a necessary openness for the spiritual problems of tomorrow and the conception of existence as open soul implies no restrictions, indeed no proposals for the other. Rather, more than anything, it implies a more radically critical European. This reflective critical turn towards its own tradition, which doesn't stop merely in, at the modern absolute subject, but progresses back to the commencement of Europe, we should understand in line with Patochka as a deconstruction of European metaphysics of the spirit. This is another quotation from the manuscripts. He speaks about destruction, but this is meant uh, um, deconstruction. The historical destruction or deconstruction of Europe emerges as the central spiritual principle something Patuchka's 
something Padochka always had in mind, the principle of the care of for the soul. It is well known that for Patochka this principle evolved into a central theme from its various texts on philosophy of history where it has an ambiguous role. It is that which is differentiated in itself, the Greco-Christian principle of old Europe, which was however not thought through to its to its end in terms of its authenticity. It is also a principle, however, that serves as a criterion or at the very, late, at the very least the navi navigational compass of spirit spirituality for future epochs of history, according to Patichka, at least for us Europeans. The concept of caring for the soul has at least two sides. It leads both to the expansion of rationality over all domains of life, as well as critical self-examination and self-renunciation. This requirement of distancing from one's own spiritual tradition is particularly important here where a reflection on the spiritual foundations should provide the framework of a philosophy of history, as is the case for Patochka. The critical deconstruction of the European tradition concludes uh, with the following insight. According to Patochka, the common denominator of this tradition and the modern European conception of superiority that follows uh, therefore, therefrom emerge from the idea of an immanent teleology of history in terms of which European man was defined. Indeed, European man's development occurred with him precisely this teleological framework. Thus, European humanity have encountered the other, and these encounters always concluded in war, which Patochka characterizes as, I quote, a battle of ownership and existence, one for the soul, a battle within the European spirit itself, end of quote. Patochka distances himself from this tradition. He writes, I quote, in this struggle, European transplanted humanity generally emerged victorious, although the outcome of large, pos of large portions of the universal front is always uncertain. Europe as the world's dominant power has perished and in this death, its metaphysics was proven inadequate. With a new humanity comes a principal revision of the question of meaning, and this question must be posed anew. End of quote. So I come to the last point, the new ground of Europe. Patochka's late work particularly his heretical essays, address precisely this fundamental revision. We can once again read the problematic of this revision in the text uh, Scheme of History, which presents one of the last <coughs> uh, works of his uh, philosophy of history. In this text, Patochka repeats his summary of the construction of his philosophy of history, now surpassed by an historical reflection on the present. This thesis claims, on the one hand, that we are at the end, that this, the end of a history formed by European Western metaphysics. I quote, our philosophy from which the central possibilities of our historical existence emerge is completely inadequate for historical humanity insofar as this philosophy can conceive of the man only as a living, das Lebendige. Uh, 
uh, end of quote. Given this failure of hitherto European spirituality, the fact that the idea has run its course and the meaning of rational civilization seem incapable of rupturing its own borders and illuminating new possibilities, prompts Patuchka's question regarding post-European humanity. Is it, I quote, capable of living historically? But he employs the old concept of historicity as a clearly defined spiritual principle, which prompts the continuation of the passage. I quote, here reflection is at stake which has to be performed not by those who enter the historical area, but by Europeans in the broader sense. What is there spiritual on this earth? What could support the belief, or better, the hope, in a life above the bi biological level? Level, end of quote. Despite the justified skepticism regarding either to European spirituality, Patochka appears nonetheless to advance on its path since he man maintains the opposition of life and spirit, wherein he apparently denies this difference even to the non-Europeans, as if the Europeans have a jurisdiction concerning matters of what is alive and what is not in the spiritual sense. This point, already developed in the third heretical essay, <coughs> namely the distinction between life and being, again emerges and is encountered in terms of Eurocentrism, Patochka's question concerning history. The Socratic care of the soul, characterized in Europe and post-Europe in terms of moral insight, sittliche uh, Einsicht, is uh, the positive which Patochka reclaim, reclaims from the European heritage for the future. With regard to moral insight, he claims that it constitutes to go the core of European humanity. I quote, immune against catastrophes and disasters and always capable of comprehensive and formal construction of unity, Einheitsbildung. The catastrophes would not mean a final failure for European humanity if reasonable, comprehensive frameworks were present for new forms, for new forms of humanity. Patochka therefore <coughs> has consciously appropriated the danger of the expanding rationality the danger of expanding rationality from Europe has therefore taken Patochka deliberately located. Patochka has uh, uh, hence a very specific uh, conception of what spiritual vitality and <coughs> existence mean, namely the struggle with the meaninglessness of existence, the fight against the say. When it comes to the ability to rid itself against the universalization of means and rationality, which is associated with the life, which Patochka attempts to think most radically with the concept of victim as the most extreme opposition of being and life, difference of being and life, then it appears to me non-European cultures are better prepared to it than the thinkers of ontological difference, like Patochka. Because for Patochka it's only about this difference, this ontological difference, not about a sacrifice for the sake of an existing purpose, like life. Life is such a purpose, only existing, only ontic, not ontological. The spiritual vitality is a 
renewal of actual historicity exist only for Patochka in the unsettling of life or shaken of life. The end of history for Patochka is hence a definitive self-occlusion of the life, of the ontic in, in, in itself. This is for him the danger which he foresees emerging out of the new post-European world and against which he wants to mobilize the spirit. Thus, he departs from the European heritage in such a way that he calls for a new, less naive Socratism. And I will sum up. In the work of Jan Patuczka, there is an answer to the challenge of post-European epoch of the history. He makes an appeal to a new spirituality which would yield a common, transcendental, deeper ground of the humanity. This, appeals, this appeal seems to be ambiguous because this new spirituality is based on the experience of the complete loss of sense, its meaninglessness, which is a condition for the care of the soul in his construction, in his philosophy. Is this the European way to renew the sense? Could it be universalized? The question. If this is what he proposes, then is Patochka's appeal, in my view, still an Eurocentric one and should be abandoned. But Patuchka's philosophy of history, only sketched here, could uh, be defended against this reproach, this criticism, as far as, as far as it is, first of all, a critical debate with our own tradition. Maybe that uh, it is this critical reflection about our way of thinking which could open ourselves to a transformative encounter with the other. Thank you for... Thank you very much, Professor Mahoney, for this very fine lecture, and the floor is open. What we do is... Please. Thank you very much. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm with this very interesting and complex reading of Papuchka. Uh, I think that the problem is very important to see whether, whether and in what particular aspects Patochka can be called a Eurocentrist. And I think that if we look at his reflections on Europe, we can see at least two groups of texts. The, the, the texts um, that are in fact just one, as in pointed out in, in your book, the Fondement Spirituel de, de l'Europe in Europe after Europe, and the, the text translated in French as Réflexion sur l'Europe uh, mm -hmm. in German, es ist immer noch eine unerfüllte Aufgabe, mm -hmm. um, which in fact, where in fact Patushka speaks of, about this mystery of the world mm -hmm. that is kept alive in cultures other than Europe, Europe being precisely, this is the, the, something that I developed in my own contribution here, Europe being precisely that cultural space where any grip, any contact with the world was abandoned. And in this sense, you, there is the exact opposite of, um, of a Eurocentrist. Europe is, should be uh, abandoned. On the other hand, when Patushka reflects on the history, uh, and maybe precisely on the care of the soul, Europe is always uh, a, a positive concept because it, it, it signifies this, this, this care for, for the soul. And so the problem, in, in, in my opinion, is how to put together these two aspects of, 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 of Patushka's reflection. I think that in order to do that, we should take into account two things. First, that it is not so very clear when Europe begins for Patushka. Of course, it's obvious to, of course, recovery, it begins with the Greeks. 
But if we look closer, he also insists about to the turning uh, point that happened in the 18th century, in the 16th century, that originated this uh, movement of hegemony of and of, of, and of conquest. The, the, through which uh, Europe uh, uh, submitted to the, the whole world. And in a certain sense, we, we may read Patoshka as a form of rejecting this modern Europe in favor of this Socratic care for the soul. This mm -hmm. would be one, one suggestion. And the other suggestion, and I think this is, this is really important, what is clear is there is no history outside Europe mm -hmm. for Papucha. Okay. Does this mean that there is no meaningful life outside Europe? To put it technically, does it mean that the third movement of existence is necessarily linked with this uh, schema developed in, in, in Europe? philosophy, philosophy and reason. Mm -hmm. Can it be developed in some other way, but in such a way as it might not give rise to history? The tendency is to oppose Europe's history to other histories that are parallel to it. But one can also rehabilitate an historical humanities. Mm -hmm. An historical in the sense that they no, don't conceive a sort of infinite project of continual progression. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> so I start with the last point. And uh, there we can really be uh, very critical to Patichka because for him the essence of humanity is this care of the soul. Um, uh, uh, those uh, presuppositions is a less of sense, uh, the, the lost of sense something which is maybe in other cultures uh, a common experience to have uh, this uh, background of nothingness uh, in, the, in the world. I, of course, don't know uh, sufficiently uh, Buddhism, but uh, it seems to me that uh, they live with this experience of a kind of nothingness which, uh, takes part, which is part of uh, the, the lived world for, for them. Maybe, yeah. maybe I'm wrong, but uh, <coughs> for Patuchka, uh, um, they, they would be uh, not historical uh, beings because of his construction of philosophy of history where only the um, explicit uh, doubts about the meaning of the whole uh, liberates us for historicity, if I can sum up uh, his position like that. So this is really dangerous. Uh, in, in that point, uh, his philosophy is really dangerous because he says to the others, no, this is not a historicity, what you have, what you are. There is a text where he says Buddhism as, um, uses Buddhism as an example for the third movement. Yes. So there is yeah. no historicity, mm. but the third movement that is full accomplishment of, of human existence. Yeah. Yeah. But this is just one test. Yeah. This, this is, this is, is well, right? yeah. yeah, it's yeah. a lecture from... Yeah, this is one text. Like the art, okay, yeah. I don't know why it's... Yeah, yeah. This, is, this is one manuscript, one text, but uh, the man, if uh, he's not shaken, has not uh, this kind of historicity. Even if uh, there is, of course, a third movement in other in other cultures, yes, of course, there is uh, such a thing. But uh, without uh, this loss of meaning of the whole, there is no dynamics of historicity in Patochka's view. And this is uh, my my would be my answer uh, to your question. And uh, this is where we have to distantiate it from. I, I would. Uh, not be, uh, I, I would not agree with him in this point. Uh, yeah, so it would be my. Mm -hmm. James? Uh, so let me see if I get this correctly. In some sense, the shaking comes from this meaning of the whole 
It requires that, and yet this meaning of the whole has no definite content, because, as you know, in the text you translated from epoch and reproduction, there is a real, uh, you know, use of Heidegger's ontological distinction to express to express this relationship, okay, to a whole that cannot be conceptualized. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have real doubts whether or not this can serve as a political kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And what prevents it from sliding off into the directions Heidegger took it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is my point. I agree with you. Uh, he's too close to Heidegger in this point. Yes. So he speaks about the Geheimnis, secret, but it's so undetermined, so out of the possibility of conceptualization that the, I, I see no other convergence than with, with Heidegger in this point. Yeah. This was your point, no? Yeah. yeah. Do you have a solution? <laughs> yeah, I, I read I read in uh, Hans Reiner Sepp uh, paper a uh, proposition how to uh, read uh, Patochka's last philosophy and namely the sixth uh, heretical essay about uh, mm -hmm. uh, wars uh, as a kind of radicalization of uh, freedom and this was the response uh, uh, done by, uh, uh, by Ricardo. Yeah. Um, the to be victim for nothing is a kind of radicalization of freedom that liberates us even from the history of being. So this would be the solution. It's very black solution. It's a very pessimistic solution. <laughs> it's not. Uh, uh, it's, it doesn't open us uh, for a, a better future, so to say. But at least. We are uh, free from this history of being that determines us, so to say, in Heideggerian terms. So, a radicalization of epoche, a radicalization of freedom, which is connected in this reading with uh, this moment to be sacrificed for nothing. Even not for being, for the better understanding of the transcendental difference, or, pardon, ontological difference. Yeah. This is more radical, uh, this uh, moment to be sacrificed for nothing. So this is a possible uh, uh, reading of the last uh, uh, text uh, by Batochka. Made. Find it convincing? And I find it convincing, yeah. Uh, because uh, this is indeed very black, so to say. This text, uh, the sixth, the last uh, heretical essay, is very pessimistic one. And uh, Paul Ricard couldn't couldn't deal with it. Yeah, this is really maybe something which goes beyond Heidegger, but in a direction that maybe we couldn't uh, share necessarily. Yeah, but at least there is a possible difference between them, even if the <coughs> even if they uh, they converge or Patushka converge to his position in the late world. So this would be my, my answer. There is a possibility of uh, to see the difference between uh, the both. Uh, in Heidegger still, there is always history of being as overwhelming construction, overglobing construction. We cannot get out of it, out of it in Heidegger. Mm -hmm. And uh, Patochka was not, didn't agree with it. I know. Yeah, so, but how to escape it? <clears throat> Sacrifice in this radical version to be sacrificed for nothing is, is one possible escape, evasion, uh, the said history of being, uh, but not a very uh, fine one, uh, not a recipe for the new humanity or something. Can I, can I make a suggestion? <coughs> Maybe the shaking of capitalism rather than the shaking of, uh, of the war might have some kind of. For you, it depends. Well, the Patochka seems to say as much at once, I think. In the notes on the post-Europe, he refers to the reduction of all 
being more like to industrial production, industrial productivity. And elsewhere, he talks about a simmering war that is often that it can be worse than a than a hot war. And there, he seems to be talking about in part about Europe's colonial time uh, fighting for peace was the mm -hmm. kind of phrase that kept on my mm -hmm. So maybe I might, I mean, there might be an alternative way to think about it is that in Plato, because the problem of Plato's Republic is precisely the problem of relating to the totality mm -hmm. without reifying that totality as a totality. Mm -hmm. So the problem of justice is how does one relate to the whole qua whole, mm -hmm. so the unification of the different parts of the soul, without that totality itself being understood as a part that I've hypothesized. Mm -hmm. So that's precisely why then, and that requires then that the whole, in relating to the whole qua whole, is qua whole that which transcends the whole. And that's the problem of the good. And the good is beyond being. It's ekenastes osias. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think Patochka has a sense of that, because then there is no fear of Heidegger, because that's the original Platonic problem of justice. Mm -hmm. So I think it's backwards to sort of be sort of traumatized by Heidegger and say, well, it has to be a Heideggerian problem. Actually, I think the strategy of Patochka is to realize that is the problem of Plato, which then has a certain kind of legacy that I want to deconstruct, mm -hmm. to put it in your mm -hmm. terms. And then in the same way for, I mean, the good is nothing. Uh, that's why I can only tell a story about it. Mm -hmm. That's why I can only use a metaphor. Um, and Socrates dies for the good, but the good is nothing. So the sacrifice of, so of Socrates is for nothing, but there we wouldn't say that it's dark. Mm -hmm. We would say actually that is almost the prototype of philosophy. Mm -hmm. So that's maybe an, an alternative strategy to get back to a more, mm -hmm. almost a more Neoplatonic, because that's a very Neoplatonic way to read mm -hmm. the Republic. Mm -hmm. And maybe Patochka has this tendency, he's a kind of Neoplatonist in how he mm -hmm. implicitly thinks about, about the problem of the Republic that he wants to return to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a very good comment. Um, I would only uh, uh, remark that in the fifth uh, heretical essay, there is another concept of the transcendence uh, opposed uh, clearly uh, to uh, the Platonic uh, tradition. And uh, this is uh, the moment uh, Derrida uh, took uh, uh, up in his commentary. And uh, this is the transcendence to uh, yeah, yeah. This is this is the uh, this is the uh, relationship to, to something which uh, the Platonism uh, rationalized and lost uh, in the history of uh, Europe. So, a radical transcendence to something which is not uh, to be attended uh, through the Platonic way of. Uh, and even Neoplatonic uh, way of uh, ascendance or transcendence. But this is another another moment uh, that uh, a little bit relative, relativize uh, this possible other escape, uh, maybe. Uh, I don't know what you mean. Yeah, but what, do you, what do you think about You get the symposium into the play, you know, where you substitute the latter of love for the orgiastic, which he sees in the. Uh, isn't that a reification? I don't know. Uh, maybe you, you can develop it a little bit more. No, I, I was saying is that in the fifth meditation, where he, he's talking about care of the soul, and he, he says, look, the problem with everyday life is boredom. Uh, one solution are this religious festivals of antiquity, which is you lose yourself within these orgiastic festivals, precisely the festival that everybody was going to go to at the beginning of the Republic. Mm -hmm. And uh, then Patashki says, Plato transformed this by talking about, you know, in the symposium about the search after the beautiful, you know, from beautiful bodies to beautiful institutions to the idea of beauty itself. And that the Eros then becomes a drawing power, not to self-forgetfulness, but towards the good. Mm -hmm. But there the complication. The question, the question then is whether or not if we take that alternative way, which he says ultimately fails, right? it's transformed by Christianity and so forth, but if we take that alternative way, do we escape reification? 
Well, well there the important, what, what's interesting about that, and it refers to things that we were discussing yesterday, is that Leo Strauss becomes, I mean, Leo Strauss argues quite correctly that there, what's lacking in the Republic is the moment of Eros. And that's what's most peculiar about it, mm -hmm. is that you have a notion of Socrates who is completely unerotic. Uh, which for Leo Strauss puts a whole question mark over the Republic as such. But then what it means is that there, there's a kind of tension already in Plato's thinking mm -hmm. between the Plato, the Socrates of the Symposium, who never is bound to the whole, because at the moment where the Diotima reveals the final vision of the whole, Socrates falls asleep, loses consciousness. Now, you can interpret that two ways. Historically, in the Neoplatonic tradition, it was understood as the moment of absorption to the whole. But you can also interpret it almost in a, in a way that at that moment he refuses the absorption to the whole because he disappears from the scene. And that's why the erotic nature of Socrates is to be in between night and day. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other Plato is precisely the Plato of the Republic. And so maybe already in Plato there is this original tension mm -hmm. that then spins out sort of different conceptions of transcendence which now are in play even in Patochka. Mm -hmm. Um, the, well, I've, I've gotten the sign that uh, we have come to the end. Um, so let me just thank you again in the name of Darian. Uh, <laughs>